All right, so welcome to the School Psychology Review Zoom webinar focusing on promoting the development of black males, supporting social, behavioral, emotional, and academic success with our distinguished panelists and guest editors here with us today, Dr. Woods, Dr. Heidelberg, Dr. Collins, and Dr. Graves, and myself, I'm the uh, editor of School Psych Review, and I'll be hosting and moderating this session uh, today. So for those of you that are active on social media, we encourage you to feature screenshots and other information that you're learning about during the session, uh, whether that's on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And also know that we are recording the session such that we can post it to be featured as a webinar on the School Psych Review YouTube channel also. So with that, uh, looking at the poll that we posted just a, a few moments ago, we can see that of the current participants already with us, that about 50% are students, about 20% are practitioners, and about 25% are faculty. So welcome to all, the other 10% are other. Uh, when we look at the interests uh, and or experience promoting the development of black males in what settings, it sort of breaks down like this. 95% of our participants presently are active or experienced or knowledgeable of working with black males in the school setting. So 95%, very large, uh, that's fantastic. 25% in community agencies, 27% in the justice system, 27% in social services, 15% in public health, and 52% focused on mental health. And again, yes, they could respond to multiple of those. So that's not intended to add up to 100. But so lots of, uh, lots of experience, uh, particularly in the schools and particularly with mental health. So welcome to all. And I'll go ahead and end that poll so it should disappear off your screen. And we'll go ahead and launch forward with uh, our presenters and giving you an overview of the topic of information today. So you can access more detailed information just briefly on the NASP website. If you typed in uh, School Psych Review Special Topic uh, NASP, it would pull up this webpage and there's some other special topics also featured in addition to this one. Uh, and then also on the Taylor and Francis site, they have uh, still a uh, featured session or featured section on this particular uh, special topic call. So again, uh, these are additional details and information that you can access easily online through either NASP and or Taylor and Francis. So let's begin by a brief introduction. Each of our presenters here will share a, a bit about themselves in terms of their current affiliation and their work and, and scholarship in this area. And then following that, I'll present the agenda and we'll get through, we'll continue with the uh, presentation of information. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Woods. All right, thanks for joining us, everyone. So I'm Dr. Isaac Woods, Jr. I'm a assistant professor in college education in the Department of uh, Education School Counseling Psychology and a school psychology uh, faculty member um, at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and we just want to make space, acknowledge our backgrounds here and give respect to the beautiful black women in our, um, that have influenced our lives so much. Uh, so behind me here is uh, Ella Baker, uh, who was a game changer in the black freedom movement uh, through her model of servant leadership, shared leadership, um, has continued to influence activists and organizers like myself um, throughout um, uh, our, our movement uh, for liberation in this country. Um, so my early research interests uh, were actually uh, related to this topic of, uh, of, of black males and critical issues um, as it relates to uh, perceptions uh, that teachers may have that contribute to the school to prison pipeline. Um, now I'm trying to advance to what type of alternatives are we going to have in place once we dismantle the school to prison pipeline and promote uh, more um, sustainable professions for black males um, that are needed. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Woods. And I'm already seeing multiple comments that they love your background, uh, lo love the background. So bravo. And uh, Dr. Heidelberg, we'll turn it over to you. Yes, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here and to share my expertise. Uh, my name is Dr. Kamonte Heidelberg. I'm an assistant professor at the University at Buffalo in Department of Counseling, School and Educational Psychology. 
My research focuses on the individual and systems level interventions to support the positive social emotional development, as well as af academic development of African American males. Um, in my background, I have Dr. Inez Beverly, who is credited as the first African American female to receive a PhD in psychology. Um, so she trailblazed the path for a lot of us today. And I definitely wanted to honor her and also acknowledge that it is Black History Month. So happy Black History Month to everyone. And I hope you enjoy our presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Heidelberg. And we'll turn it over to Dr. Collins. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here and share with everyone today. I want to um, first off acknowledge the moment of four Black males coming together to guest, issue, to guest uh, edit a special issue on Black males in our field. This is definitely the route that our field needs to go. So I'm excited to uh, really just kind of acknowledge that moment and the history of that. Um, my name is Ty Collins. I'm an associate professor and coordinator of the School Psychology Program at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, my research is on um, interventions for Black students in urban schools. Uh, I've done a lot around uh, peer-mediated interventions from a critical race theory perspective. And um, related to that, my uh, the beautiful Black woman who I am honoring today is Gloria Ladson billings who is a trailblazer in the work uh, around critical race theory and especially applying uh, CRT to other fields, including education. So that was who I would like to uh, honor on today. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Graves. Um, same as my colleague, just want to acknowledge, uh, thanks for everyone, first of all, taking the time to be here with us. Um, I know people are really extremely busy, so we want to acknowledge that, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, but my name is Dr. Scott Graves, Associate Professor um, at The Ohio State University. Uh, my research can be uh, broadly categorized understanding protective factors um, in early childhood to lead to positive social, emotional, and academic development in Black children. Um, also, when we talk about backgrounds, I, I also wanted to acknowledge it is Black History Month, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a West Virginia guy, and everyone who knows me knows I, I always mention that. So I want to always honor um, the West Virginia Trailblazers in my life and also nationally. So to my left, um, you see my Aunt Sarah, named Sarah Hall. She's the first Black um, elected prosecuting attorney in the state of West Virginia. And she was um, extremely, extremely important and vital to my life um, and where I'm at today. The middle picture, which is which is covered up, is um, the graduating class of Bluefield State College in 1903. And so that's my one of my great grandmothers. She's um, in that picture. So we're an HBCU family. And to my right is uh, Ms. Catherine Johnson. Um, for most folks have seen the, the movie Hidden Figures. And uh, she's also a distinguished uh, West Virginia form, you know, resident. She, she recently transitioned, but um, I always want to acknowledge those people in my life from West Virginia and help me to get to the place that I'm at today. So those are my role models when I was growing up and uh, helped me get to where I'm at. So, um, you know, thanks for people, individuals coming and that's uh, who I am today. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. Graves. So welcome to each. And uh, as I mentioned briefly, I'm the, Shane Jimerson. I'm the editor of School Psych Review and also a professor at the University of California here in Santa Barbara. Uh, my scholarship focuses broadly on promoting the development uh, socially, emotionally, behaviorally, mental health, uh, but promoting the development of children at school uh, in particular. And I wanted to also just simply highlight as Dr. Collins had noted uh, that this is uh, making history in the moment with four black males uh, serving as guest editor of the School Psych Review uh, special topic section focused on black on facilitating the development and success of black males. So bravo to each of you. And I know this has been in the works for some time, uh, beginning even with some of the efforts uh, in 2019 and such and some of the discussions and having this uh, featured special topic section now forthcoming is it's, it's fantastic. So just wanted to also uh, note that as well. Okay. So I see a lot of folks uh, chatting in the box and that's great, recognizing that there's opportunity to exchange information with uh, other participants as well as the panelists. And as I indicated, there will be time at the end for some question and answers. Although if there's particular questions that surface and a panelist member notes it and wants to address it on the, on the go, we can also incorporate that. Although for timing, we don't wanna to get too bogged down in a bunch of questions where they're not able to uh, present the information that they had prepared. So we'll try to keep track of some of these questions and I'll take a look. And then when we get to the end for certain, we've uh, preserved some time. 
But what's going to unfold here is each of the panelists uh, would prepare a slide deck where they'll present some information about the context as related to this uh, topic, the importance of this topic, the purpose of this special topic section. Uh, that, and then we'll also, uh, that'll probably take 30, 35 minutes. We'll also then be able to share some information briefly about the types of manuscripts, the due date, which again, you can see right here is uh, 4 15, 2021. And uh, then we'll do the question and answers there at the end. So that's our agenda for today. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive in and you'll get to hear from each of the presenters. I believe it starts off with Dr. Collins. Absolutely. So I'll get us started with the kind of overarching frame for our conversation today, really starting with uh, social justice in our field, as well as critical race theory uh, specifically. So um, looking broadly, we know that social justice is a huge um, aspect of our field currently and where our field is definitely going. We have a lot of work, uh, especially in uh, NASP around social justice around different committees. There are, there's the EDI implementation task force, there are the social justice podcasts, lots of great work happening um, within uh, the organization and within our field around social justice. Uh, we've all seen this wonderful uh, circle now with our domains of uh, practice as school psychologists uh, and domain eight is equitable practices for diverse populations. So definitely represented within um, how we should be doing business as school psychologists. In terms of how we define social justice, there are lots of different definitions uh, in lots of different fields. Uh, my favorite definition was actually from uh, the one that was adopted by the NAS Board of Directors in April 2017. I know some of the folks here, um, our attendees, were in that room and part of that great work to develop what I think is an awesome uh, definition around social justice. We know with, within social justice, we're looking at distributive justice, so how um, resources are allocated in buildings. We're looking at procedural justice in terms of our policies and practices, uh, as well as relational justice around how folks are treated, whether schools are safe and positive affirming environments um, and uh, affirming for folks of various identities within school buildings. Uh, so this um, definition covers all those different things around assuring the educational rights and opportunities for all children. Um, I love the part about uh, especially those whose voices have been muted, identities obscured or needs ignored. That's absolutely um, indicative of what happens in schools every day and how we need to change uh, what we're doing in schools. And so moving past just non-discriminatory practices, but empowering uh, families and communities and really having um, systems and practices that affirm uh, who children are and who their families are and center them uh, in what we're doing in schools. And of course, thinking about equity and fairness uh, around how uh, students and families are treated within school buildings. The next piece I did want to uh, frame is around critical race theory. Again, the wonderful uh, Gloria Latham Billings has really um, applied critical race theory, uh, which started with uh, critical legal studies and uh, definitely a lot of work in the legal area around policies and practices and laws that uh, have not changed so much uh, over the last uh, few uh, centuries and how uh, those policies and practices affect uh, various communities with regard to race. Um, and this has been applied to a variety of different uh, fields, including education uh, and now school psychology, which is awesome. Uh, so this requires us to critically examine what we do in schools, what we do in our graduate programs, what we do uh, in our lives in general around policies, practices, and the cultures that we are establishing and maintaining. Uh, there are four major tenets of critical race theory. Uh, the first is just a complete requirement that we have to acknowledge that racism is as American as apple pie. It is what this country has been built on and what maintains uh, the power of this country. And so we need to uh, understand that, know how it uh, interacts and how it um, shows up in our daily lives and in our daily um, interactions. A lot of times we think of racism as like people in KKK hoods, but uh, that's prejudice, right? Racism is those same people uh, who are our teachers and our school psychologists and our faculty members. Uh, and it's also all of us who, whether knowingly or unknowingly, maintain those systems of white supremacy within this country. So I will get off that soapbox for now. Um, the next uh, tenet around critical race theory is the importance of 
storytelling uh, and whose voices are censored within the work. And this is definitely relevant to uh, the work that we're looking for uh, for this special issue. And what we would like to um, continue within our field is centering the voices of black males specifically and of other uh, minoritized populations. One example, a big pet peeve of mine is the teacher student relationship literature that um, almost um, exclusively uh, centers the voices of teachers and how they feel about the relationship and not so much how the students or the families feel about the teacher student relationship. So moving past uh, centering uh, the, the adults and the teachers but really centering uh, students and their experiences within schools, the importance of counter narratives. So um, we know, you know, who controls uh, a variety of narratives and who's written history books and those types of things. So the importance of centering the voices of minoritized individuals to provide a counter narrative. And finally, place making, right? So having spaces within um, overall spaces for minoritized individuals to come together, to be themselves, to not have to think about how they navigate a variety of other spaces, but having uh, places that are relevant for them. Another tenet is that uh, we, you know, th these changes in how we do business in schools requires massive changes. Um, incremental changes are not going to get us there uh, in, in terms of turning around centuries of oppression and marginalization in, in this country. And so we need uh, massive changes. We need um, radical thinking and, and changing how we do business in schools. And finally, um, there's this idea of interest convergence theory, which is that um, white people are um, interested in changing uh, laws and practices and policies uh, when it benefits them rather than when it benefits minoritized individuals. So uh, one of the examples here uh, is around affirmative action, right? And we know that those laws were put in place to protect um, and support minoritized individuals, but white women, for example, have uh, benefited uh, most from affirmative action policies um, throughout um, their history. And so uh, thinking about um, making sure that when we are changing our policies and practices, that they are actually benefiting the people for whom uh, we are changing them and that we are looking at things from an equity lens. So I think we'll next go into uh, black males specifically and how they are uh, treated and their experiences in schools. Yes, thank you, Dr. Collins. So here is a graphic where you can find the latest statistics regarding achievement from the US Department of Education. So although this, this graphic does not highlight specifically um, achievement differences for black males, you can see here that across various subjects, core subjects within schools, African-American students continue to be furthest uh, behind. So given the discrepancies in achievement, implications such as overrepresentation of black males in special education start to arise here. So instead of focusing on the discrepancies of achievement based on assessments, we should really be talking about the factors that are affecting black males achievements. So to the right, you will see various systemic factors that are embedded within our institutions that are really impacting the success and academic achievement of our black males. You want the next one? Yes, Dr. next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, just pass me around, I'll get it. There you go. Perfectly. Uh, so building off the many systemic factors impeding on black males, exclusionary discipline continues to be a well-documented factor impeding African-American males uh, achievement. So discipline disproportionately continues to be a major problem that we see within our schools, where we see in, uh, certain demographics are continuously receiving over discipline compared to others. Given this, black male students are more likely than any other group to receive exclusionary discipline. This includes in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, as well as expulsion. From this, we're seeing major implications such as the school-to-prison pipeline, which is well-documented as well as a barrier impeding our Black males in schools. So if you're not familiar with the school-to-prison pipeline, that refers to the policies and practices that criminalize the educational system. So policies such as zero tolerance or having practices such as school resource officers uh, really is putting a, a greater barrier on our students to obtain the achievement. So we really want to change that mindset from looking at deficits to more so understanding why this, these uh, deficits are occurring. And then that kind of informs our interventions and supports for this particular population of students. Next slide, please. This is Dr. Woods, is that right? 
Yes, I was trying to find my uh, unmute button. Uh, so thank you. Um, it's right where it's always been. <laughs> uh, so uh, these professionals uh, that I have listed here are um, <clears throat> essential for survival, basically, uh, that we have here, these demographics. Uh, and so the lack, lack of growth in um, these areas of um, education, um, health, and mental health school psychologists is concerning have grave consequences that contribute to some of these educational disparities and health disparities among black males. And so just some of these statistics here, the work first of black male teachers is at 2%. Um, and you may hear some say that this is a number that has decreased since Brown v. Board, since school desegregation. Um, and this is a alarming concern as uh, more schools are being more and more diverse. And we find out that black male teachers are beneficial for every student in the school setting. Um, and then second, what we see here is even more alarming is a 39% decrease in the number of black male medical school graduates. Uh, so providers of health. Uh, so when we think about mort mortality rates, we think about uh, access to health services and understanding barriers that prevent uh, people from pursuing um, checkups, routine checkups, and going to visit the doctor. Uh, we have a decrease in Black males who are graduating. It's the only demographic that has decreased um, over time since 1986. And there's an estimated shortage that they predict between anywhere between 50,000 and 90,000 physicians that we anticipate in 2025. And finally, we have our profession. Uh, school psychology. And schools, if you think about these settings and community settings, are some of the primary resources for students to access uh, mental health services, behavioral health services, and the lack of growth of this area as well is uh, concerning. Next slide. So now we get into how do we support Black males. So to the uh, right, you can see various supports that we can embed to really be beneficial for supporting Black male students. Uh, to, the, to the left, we always have to have a triangle within any school psychology presentation. Uh, so this is really highlighting a multi-tiered system of support. Uh, but with that, we want to ensure that our multi-tier system of support includes culturally responsive interventions to really meet the needs of African-American students. So for example, when we talk about Afrocentric interventions, these type of interventions can serve as a protective factor for the psychological well-being of African-American male students. Also, just building on social emotional learning, these uh, type of interventions can provide key competencies to help navigate the barriers found in the school systems that's really impacting our African-American students. There's also lots of evidence around building positive peer relationships as well as positive relationships with adults in those buildings. But what we're gonna talk about a little bit shortly, uh, not only do we just want our social emotional learning to be embedded, but we want this to, once again to be culture responsive, meaning it's meeting the needs of the students specifically. I also wanted to add here, um, we need to think about how we frame intervention in school. So we oftentimes think of tier two for kids who don't respond to tier one, um, when we really should be switching that language to talk about tier one not being sufficient for those kids, rather than um, pathologizing the students in terms of being non-responders to an intervention. We're implementing tier two to achieve equitable outcomes in our schools um, for students for whom tier one was not sufficient. Also based on that, uh, we really want to acknowledge that while, while we have the triangle there and we talk about culturally specific interventions, school psychology is really in its infancy um, when it comes to supporting black males. Uh, most of the work that has that has focused on black males is from a counseling psychology, educational psychology, developmental psychology standpoint. So um, while we, we have seen a lot of growth um, in the last decade specifically, um, when we look at black males, we really still are in our infancy. And I'll, I'll give you an example here. When we talk about racial and ethnic identity, um, it's something that has been studied uh, extensively um, in developmental psychology and counseling psychology. And what we know about that, especially for black boys, um, is that individuals uh, with a strong racial identity have more, a lot more positive outcomes, okay? And, and this goes about through a process called racial socialization. And so when we see those meta-analysis, um, we see a couple of different things. Um, and those are gender-based, okay? A lot of those reports are based on mothers and what, how they prepare their sons um, and, and their daughters. But for their sons specifically, uh, they give more preparation for biased messages. And we think, hey, that's a good thing. We wanna prepare you because a lot of parents say, hey, 
you looked at as dangerous, um, you looked at as threatening. However, um, those outcomes are a double-edged sword because more, more individuals here, you know, we're preparing you because individuals, you look a certain way or you sound a certain way. Um, their research also shows at least the high blood pressure, at least the strokes when you're an adult and those kind of things. So in school psychology, you really need to hold individuals like more accountable, like for bias training and accountability. And we think school should be safe places um, for black boys and for all children in general, but Recent research shows that's not the case. Um, teachers hold the same levels of pro-white, explicit, and implicit racial bias um, as the general population, okay? And also from an appearance standpoint, we've seen this in meta-analysis, also social psychology research has done a good job of this. They've shown um, just based on appearance, okay? Black boys are viewed as older. Um, black boys are viewed as adultified. And black boys with like Afrocentric features. Um, I say black boys look like me rather, like with wide noses and, and, and broad shoulders. Um, when you see those individuals, you don't give them the benefit of the doubt. And social psychology has really done a good job of that. Um, and the last thing I'll mention about that is like what Dr. Woods said about increasing diversity by profession and our teachers specifically. Um, there was a good column by Andre Perry. Um, and this was 20, 2020 in the uh, Hedginger Report about the educational value of black teachers. And he, he did a lot of, um, about summarizing the research on uh, what's the importance of black teachers and black professionals. And here's one stat I'll leave you for black boys. Um, when black boys had a teacher, um, a black teacher in third, fourth or fifth grades, um, they were 39% less likely to drop out of high school. And so school psychology thinks of itself as an evidence-based profession, evidence-based practice. So those are the type of things that um, black teachers diversifying the profession um, can bring to that. All right, and thank you, Dr. Graves. And so extending beyond uh, ways in which we could support black males and thinking about the family and communal structures uh, that encompasses black life in the United States of America um, and extending beyond this nuclear family of, of a father and a mother or the um, uh, almost superhero trope of a black single mother uh, and extending this to the very broad uh, family members that we have and assets that we have in our community, such as uncles, aunts, grandparents, cousins, godparents, step-parents, church family, um, brothers from another mother, whatever, that uh, play a huge role in who we identify with as family, who we share communal structures with as our values and our culture and within our communities. And so not limiting, just thinking about whatever legal guardianship is uh, defined by public schools and by law, and expand this to look at these other aspects and this deep pool of support that our black sons uh, have. And then in advancing to community engagement, uh, we need to move past passive involvement strategies, one directional communications uh, into a more collaborative in partnerships uh, as these families and these students know what's best for them. They know that what obstacles they face as they live through them every day and engage and center these families and incorporate their strengths from the culture of their community to be a part of the school environment. And so these can be done by looking at what values are we doing, are we taking from the community and using and incorporating our schools when we, when we implement PBIS, uh, when we implement some of these uh, social emotional learning um, and how are these values already existing and maintaining and fostering resilience outside of the schools instead of trying to conform them to what has been established through peer review literature or what has been established through um, uh, 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 models in other schools, but what's really gonna serve this community, this population that we have in front of us. Uh, additionally, um, expanding restorative justice uh, is not just a thing that happens in a school, but inviting the community to address community issues that affect these children as they leave and go home and having the school as a space uh, for community uh, restorative justice be implemented by sending school hours if it's possible, also including job training um, uh, for, for, for Black youth as well. And connecting scholars with alumni of graduates who have been successful and hopefully can return and contribute to this school. And thinking about uh, anti-racist policies that we have, uh, a lot of things that you normally hear, uh, particularly after this summer, a lot of statements were made by school districts uh, that are grappling with uh, the, the civil unrest that occurred and the movement for black liberation, the current iteration that happened this past summer. Uh, and statements were made by districts, superintendents about hiring practices, policies, um, but really what accountability is gonna be put in place for these policies that we have and should we use the school officials to be 
uh, the ones who hold their, themselves accountable, or should we make this open up to family and community members uh, who send their sons and daughters to schools to be part of uh, the accountability or some type of family community task or advisory board uh, to evaluate these effectiveness of these policies that may happen uh, or maybe propose, excuse me. And then thinking about equity focused funding, uh, really a school psychologist, I think this is something we need to be more involved in and evaluating revenue expenditures uh, in school budgets and looking at uh, cost effective analysis. I know there was a special issue not too long ago that, that was a great start on uh, programs to maximize the resources for black males and finding what is the most efficient and effective ways uh, to promote success uh, throughout the schooling experience. And then thinking about the systems and structures that were that prevented some of these funding revenues to be uh, used for schools. So there's school districts that have formulas that are being used. Um, it's particularly a lot of urban school districts to uh, calculate ways in which equity can be used and embedded in ways funds and resources are distributed, distributed to certain schools based off of uh, uh, from, from their tax revenue. And so these sources come from city, county taxes, possibly um, that we need to investigate how funding in the larger city and counties are being allocated to schools versus prisons or police force um, in these, in these uh, schools in which black youth are situated in. And a phenomenon that's really been happening pretty recently uh, that I think we need to pay more attention to and support more is participatory budgeting at the school level. So this is happening at school districts in New York, um, Arizona, um, and it really puts uh, the ownership and the responsibility on students and on families of identifying what their needs are and telling the school our, our public money that we're spending taxes and we're generating for uh, school services, where these need to go to support us uh, as we advance uh, promotion for black males. Next slide. That's great. So in this slide, we're talking about things that need to be built from the ground up in terms of um, direct supports for Black males. We can also think about adapting evidence-based interventions for Black males. One of the things that we know um, is that our criteria for evidence-based interventions have nothing to do with the populations uh, in those studies and who uh, these, these interventions have been demonstrated to be evidence-based for. Uh, so a lot of the work is in addition to building things from the ground up, adapting interventions that we have some evidence for to specifically work within the context for Black males. Um, we have this uh, real interest in our field around, again, pathologizing students and labeling them uh, and not considering their strengths and what uh, positive things they're bringing to the table and how we can utilize those uh, to better support their development. Um, another thing to think about is uh, around the implementation aid agents, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. Uh, who's implementing the intervention? Can we include student voice in who's implementing their intervention? How about having them pick who they want their mentor to be um, or, and or pairing uh, their mentors based on race, based on ethnicity and other um, types of things uh, to make sure that we're choosing agents that make sense uh, for those populations. And thinking about the materials that we have in our interventions? What's the representation in our SEL curriculum? What examples are we providing? Uh, are these examples consistent with students' culture and who they are as people? Um, and do we center their voices in uh, the work that we're doing in schools? So one way that we can really start adapting our interventions is to include an Afrocentric uh, pedagogy. So we know that traditional education inadequately teaches black students about their history and cultures. Uh, it's black history month now. So we typically see that they start with slavery when we're, we're teaching about black history. But we all know that there's historical references and a lot of great history before slavery that's often not taught or just left out. So when you take that Afrocentric ap uh, approach, you're really providing students with that unique perspective to be able to be a protective factor against some of the barriers found in their schools. So we're equipped them with the history to know about um, your ancestors. Um, I like the, the, the quote that says your crown has been paid the way for you or already um, paid for you. So that's kind of that Afrocentric terminology where we're getting our students to understand that we're all connected. Um, Afrocentrism really goes off of those key principles uh, that every African-American student should live by. So for example, unity, emoja, some of those pieces that we really want to start embedded into our interventions to be more 
pertinent for our uh, African American male students. So with that, we can see how these type of interventions, they really teach students about their heritage, their history and their cultures, and it serves as protective factors from all those barriers that are repeating on these students. Yes, and this is an approach that emphasizes agency uh, to people of African descent uh, in creating and sustaining our cultural knowledge um, uh, that not only aids them in their survival to oppression, but in challenging oppression, transforming the, the realities. Um, and it also seeks to correct what is happened to be mistakes or things that are perpetuated by ideas of racist philosophy uh, that escaped and, and that escaped um, and, and invaded our uh, our public school systems and could be found in curriculum or even just societal values and messages that we receive. And, and this goes back to what uh, Dr. Collins said on, on the slide that kind of introduced this section. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my graduate students um, who, who assisted with this publication, also on, listed on this publication, um, wouldn't be made possible without them. Uh, Ms. Shanye Phillips, Mr. Mark Jones, and Ms. Kiana Johnson. And this was recently published, um, Systematic Review of the What Works Clearinghouse Behavioral Intervention Evidence Does it Relate um, to Black Children. And so one of the things Dr. Collins mentioned, um, you know, who's in the intervention research base? And so what we found here is that what works clearing houses, which is the government's national standard for evidence. So today, if you want to apply for IES grant, you want to receive any type of funding from the government, you have to say, you know, what type of evidence by what works clearing house standard. So this is the gold standard um, that education researchers go by and, and live by and have to get funded by now. And so we just took a look at uh, what they considered you know, evidence-based research. And so none of that research really included black children. Um, there were a couple large studies um, done that did include black children, but as far as interventions that had um, broke, you know, criteria down by race, black boys, black girls, none of those research studies did that. So what we really know um, about, you know, school psychology, behavior interventions is in its infancy, like we mentioned earlier. And so, we're really glad to get that publication now. I hope people can really build on that. And one thing we want to emphasize to, to the people who are here with us and to the people who might listen later is um, really, you know, break down your results by race, by gender, you know, what works for whom, right? And that's the thing that we say all the time in school psychology, but we're really finding out um, a lot of the things that we talk about here aren't really relevant um, to black boys. And we really need a specific research agenda um, that looks at things by gender and by race. And so we hope this can be the start of that. Next slide. All right, so uh, we also wanted to highlight peer-mediated interventions. We know that Black students uh, still experience segregated schools where they are uh, in schools with lots of kids who look like them, um, very few teachers, school psychologists, principals, and counselors who look like them. So really thinking about, uh, again, who is implementing the intervention and are there ways to involve peers, similarly acculturated peers, um, to implement interventions in schools. So um, this uh, book was recently published on peers exchange agents. Each chapter includes um, information around different types of peer mediated interventions, restorative justice, uh, peer tutoring, uh, peer modeling, lots of different types of interventions, as well as um, how to uh, use those interventions uh, in terms of culturally adapting them uh, for various populations within schools. Uh, one of the chapters here uh, discusses the importance of peers as culturally relevant change agents and uh, makes a case for why peers uh, can be uh, utilized within schools to support each other. Um, the first one is that communal orientation. So typical um, kind of white American middle-class values are around competition and having more and being better than others. Whereas the orientation uh, around black uh, students uh, is typically much more around community as we've been talking about today. So the idea of um, kind of a rising tide lifting all boats and us all working together to uh, improve all of our standing, which again is, is uh, consistent with the critical race theory uh, perspective as well in terms of building communities of scholars within schools. Um, we know that in the um, counseling literature and the 
uh, therapy literature that um, there's a preference for racial ethnic match within um, psychologists and with counselors in terms of minoritized populations. Uh, we know from great work from Jamelia Blake and others around uh, cultural mismatches in schools uh, and the populations of students versus uh, teachers, as well as the, the lack of synchrony between um, the cultures of teachers and the cultures of the students they're serving. And finally, having similarly acculturated peers uh, to serve as models for uh, appropriate behaviors in schools and how to support each other uh, within school buildings. So what we're providing next is just a few resources uh, that we just wanted to highlight. I know just want to be uh, sensitive of time here and I want to leave some room for questions. Um, so we're not going to spend too much time. I'll let my esteemed colleagues jump in as uh, they feel needed, but we just wanted to highlight a few resources uh, to equip you to be able to build on your own competency and build your knowledge so you can have a frame of reference where you can incorporate some of these supports to really be more effective with our Black males. So I'm going to pass it to any of my colleagues to see if they had comments. I'll just jump in here on, on this slide, Dr. Heidelberg. So on the left, you see um, a Black male teacher um, with, with a Black boy. That's a special series that is uh, run also in Milwaukee and in, in Tennessee that talks about uh, the impacts of black male teachers and mentoring and reading. Uh, we currently have a reading crisis um, in, in the United States of America. You know, in general, with black boys specifically, um, if you look at uh, the, national social, the national assessment of educational progress, you know, some cities, um, we look at uh, black boys, you know, reading levels. You know, we have cities where 80% of black boys basically can't read who below basic. And so that series there, um, if you, you know, search that series, um, it's, a, it's a great series to read, to see how impactful uh, Black teachers can be. And so that's a resource we want to provide into individuals with. So here's another resource we have. I actually want to uh, pull in uh, Shane in here uh, just to see if you want to make a comment regarding this Black male research um, piece. Yes, I, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have had an opportunity to check this out. The Black male research uh, website that features over 700 research papers on a range of topics. It really does appear to be a great resource and clearinghouse. The website's listed there, uh, diversity.utexas.edu, and then black-male-education-research. So I encourage each of you to check that out because the papers are grouped by topical areas. Uh, for instance, uh, in education, achievement gap, special education, gifted education, uh, dropout, high school dropout, gender identity, social justice, uh, there's school, school health, psychological health, also particular articles featured on the school to prison pipeline and also uh, on black males in the criminal justice system as well. So just a resource that folks might find of uh, value and especially if you're working on preparing scholarship or papers that address some of these topics, this may be a great resource to identify some of the uh, existing scholarship in this area. So thanks. And uh, just in our brief time that we have remaining, um, I'm going to try concisely just uh, highlight a couple of articles that we identified uh, here. So this first one at the top is a uh, review of literature that provides uh, and explores a concept of Black boys being endangered or beyond reach and counters that with evidence of success uh, in certain contexts uh, for Black males. And it presents uh, a well narrative that parents, teachers, and Black boys themselves uh, may have that may also serve to reinforce uh, some of these narratives or views that Black boys are beyond hope in ways to challenge this uh, moving forward. And then the next article uh, by Stone and colleagues, a uh, boy with a toy, Black male uh, with gun, uh, is a qualitative content analysis uh, looking at how online news articles um, after the first 48 hours of the police murder of Tamir Rice uh, framed, primed, and set agendas on this young Black boy's life, uh, death, uh, so to say, um, and were complicit in that as well. 
um, and how they largely supported uh, initial reports by police narratives without challenging uh, them and, and putting Rice, uh, Tamir Rice, as being non-compliant or threatening a subject uh, of the police and saying police were right uh, in reacting in the ways they did out of concern of public safety. Um, and we all have seen the video by now, or at least heard of it, of uh, what essentially looked like a drive-by shooting of a 12-year-old. And the uh, last article on this slide, uh, and then I'll turn on Dr. Graves, um, is by um, uh, uh, understanding discipline, disproportionalities, and stereotypes, uh, and how they shape pre-service teachers' beliefs about Black boys uh, in urban education. It was published in Urban Education, so really gets at disproportionality um, in discipline, school discipline, school in Black males being pushed out of schools using an attribution-based attribution approach to investigate pre-service uh, attitudes of students' behavior, um, and also how this beliefs that they have uh, influences their response to student behaviors. And they found that these uh, pre-service teachers attributed misbehavior of Black male students uh, after they read a vignette, comparing that to other random sample of uh, Black uh, pre-service teacher, teachers reading a vignette of white male students um, as uh, male students being more stable, their attributions of misbehavior being more stable over time and led them to alter their behavior um, towards these students. Next slide. Um, for, for this slide, um, this is what uh, Dr. Woods and Dr. Heidelberg were talking about when they were talking about Afrocentric intervention specifically. Um, one of my former advisees and now colleague, uh, Dr. Candace Ashton, um, she modified Dr. Faye Belgrave's curriculum, uh, Sisters of Nia, which is also Brothers of Gene as well. Uh, one is for females, uh, one is for males. And she, to my knowledge, is the first one who modified a, a specific Afrocentric curriculum uh, to look at that within uh, a school-based setting. So she really was influential in helping me get those, but they work in schools. Um, so a lot of people think, hey, I, I can't implement this, I can't do this, but um, we, went, we had an article on the left, a mixed method study of social emotional curriculum for black males. And that was the Brothers of Jima curriculum uh, that Dr. Woods and Dr. Heidelberg showed. And so it does increase those aspects um, that Dr. Heidelberg mentioned. And so, you know, we encourage folks to, to read up on that literature. Um, the article to the right is um, another article was published when I was at Duquesne University. Um, and so that article was a, was a randomized trial. We did a, the strong start intervention, but I, I'll give you some quick background on that. Um, we had used it earlier um, for, for a couple other projects and it didn't work as well um, as it had when it was in Oregon. And so the schools I work with people know um, are usually you know, anywhere from 90 to 100% uh, black. And so Dr. Ashton and Dr. Savaro, now, now Dr. Purdue, um, she, she helped modify that curriculum. So we used different books. We went to the, to the library and we used black specific books, um, picture books that individuals can see themselves within those books. And so it worked a lot better um, in this trial. So that's why this one was published. There's other work that's been done that hasn't been published, but this was published. Um, and so, you know, use black characters in your books, be specific in your pedagogy. And so uh, we just wanted to highlight those things, uh, be specific in your agency and what you do. And we'd love to get to uh, the question and answer uh, portion of this. So we'll kind of briefly talk about the topics of emphasis for our special issues specifically. I uh, really wanted to cast a wide net on any uh, work that would center the experiences um, and uh, support the development of black males in schools. Uh, so all these um, ideas on the next couple slides are all uh, within the uh, call for papers that have that's been uh, widely shared with you can share it again uh, in the chat. We're really looking very broadly at any types of work, um, any methodology that would really support um, Black males in schools. And another piece is that we really want to, again, center Black males. So there could be some comparison studies, but the work would need to be uh, centering uh, specifically on Black males and their experiences in schools. Excellent. Any other comments anyone want to make there? I think Dr. Collins covered most of these details. Thank you. And again, just to remind uh, everyone participating or watching this online that the deadline for the receipt of the submissions for
for consideration for this special topic section is April 15th, uh, 2021. So coming up here in the next couple of months, you can simply submit online by going to the Taylor and Francis. Uh, the backslash USPR is the uh, school psych review link there and you can submit in that portal. The portal will look like this. Uh, when you go in there, uh, you can choose submit an article. And uh, in there, when you are submitting the paper for this special topic section, please do in the cover letter, uh, make the, spe specify that that's helpful for us uh, to know that you are seeking consideration for potential publication in the special topic section such that we can route it to the appropriate uh, guest editors, action editors who you've been introduced to today. And that should be relatively straightforward in the system. But if you have other questions about it, feel free to reach out and ask us questions. But again, with the due date being uh, April 15th, and we extended that based on with the COVID context and everything else that's been happening through, throughout the past uh, year, but especially in the past few months, we did extend that to the April 15th date to give folks a bit more time to prepare those papers. So we anticipate uh, that that will be the final uh, due date for the incoming submissions. And then as Dr. Collins had shared, uh, we wanted to preserve a, a bit of time here at the end to have a brief discussion, uh, answer some questions. Uh, perhaps in the chat, you can identify any particular questions or topics that you would appreciate getting our distinguished panelists uh, perspective on to share information. And I have noted throughout the uh, session, throughout the webinar today, that there's been tremendous enthusiasm for the content that each of the panelists has been presenting and also the sharing of information and resources that each of you has made available and colleagues have been posting uh, great, great information in the chat. So let's see if there's uh, particular questions that surface here, we'll give it a few seconds as people might be typing. Oh, Dr. And, Jimson, I did see a question um, that other people have follow-up questions on. The question was from uh, Tony Thomas, the panelist. Uh, what tasks can future school psychologists of color do in this area to move the field forward in this area that have immediate impact uh, with black male students? Um, th this is something we talked about, um, you know, during the, during the Twitter chat for this. You know, Look, look at black boys and show them empathy. So like that, that can be done immediately. Um, you know, right now, black boys don't receive the same type of grace um, for, for behaviors, for, for whatever type of, if, you know, issues they have going on in their lives and their lives, you know, still matter um, just like other kids. But when we see, you know, the research area, it, it's really clear um, how teachers view black boys and those kind of things. So that can be done immediately. Also understand um, what's best practices, you know, what, what we have limited now. I, I mentioned the article in the Twitter chat about depression, okay? We have no randomized trials um, for childhood depression that disaggregate data by gender and race, you know? So we don't even know what best practices are for, as far as depression and interventions and those kind of things. So when I say look outside the school psychology research base, I really, you know, it, you know encourage everyone to do that, whether it be developmental psych literature, um, so like SRCD, Society for Research and Child Development, um, they really focus the researchers there on racial identity um, and those kind of things. So I, I, I would really look outside that literature and also, you know, you know, look at what some of the black psychologists are publishing in academia. Okay, like see what they're publishing, what they're talking about. But don't stop there. We have great practitioners and some I see in, in the chat, um, you know, uh, Erica Wood is, is, is here in the chat. Um, these people, and I'm not putting them out there to, to have them volunteer, but these folks are available. They come to NASP and, and they're, you know, they know what's going on and, you know, talk to other folks and they teach also in other institutions. So talk to practitioners, talk to researchers, talk to people who you've seen in this chat. Um, so I would encourage people to do that. Now, I can talk a lot, but I'll cede the floor to my colleagues. I know they want to interject as well. I would add, um developing accountability structures in schools. So we know that a lot of the issues that we see with uh, black students in schools uh, around uh, is around teachers kind of baiting them and uh, in pre and like not de-escalating, we're really escalating their problem uh, behaviors and really kind of increasing the likelihood that these kids are gonna get uh, suspended, expelled and arrested in schools. We know that that's the quickest way for um, black kids to go uh, to jail or have involvement with the juvenile justice system is to be arrested in schools, right? So 
really thinking about how do we set up uh, accountability structures in schools so that the teachers who need more support around race and bias and these kind of issues, um, the administration who need more support, uh, receive those supports in schools and are held accountable uh, for changing their behaviors and changing how they uh, support students in schools because then we can get to a place where we have more equitable structures in schools. We can have the most amazing evidence-based intervention, but if I don't like my teacher and my teacher doesn't like me, we're done, right? So how do we build relationships? And then even more importantly, how do we repair those relationships and um, improve those relationships in the future? And uh, Dr. Collins, your comments there do relate to one of the questions that I had noticed in the uh, question and answer queue. Uh, one of the participants had asked the question, how do you educate teachers on interpreting the play of black boys in school? And so obviously some of your comments, Dr. Collins, would be relevant there. I don't know if uh, you or other colleagues uh, have any further uh, perspective you'd like to share regarding how you educate teachers on interpreting the play of black boys in school. Absolutely. So part of it is really about what are the rules and policies and practices in our building and do they serve the teachers or do they serve the students, right? So do the students have any voice in what the rules are and, and how we uh, treat each other in schools? And then uh, specifically around play and interpreting behaviors, it's really helping to support teachers in not centering themselves and how they grew up and what they expect um, and centering the students, right? So what is their culture and what expectations can I have that are appropriate for them? Uh, within the uh, TFI, there's a cultural responsiveness guide. Um, and within that, there's a good, um, it's called the elements of culture activity that you can lead your teachers and other staff in where it asks them to think about what was my culture growing up around respect, right? How do I view respect? Um, what's my current culture? What's the culture of the students in my building and, and in the community? And do those things converge or do they diverge? And then how do I um, create expectations and change my behaviors to be consistent with them and not try to force them to serve me. We are here to serve children in schools, not the other way around. So that would be my response to that. And I would just kind of build on that, it, going along with changing that system and using that culture responsive PBIS implementation at the core, you're really getting into centering those student voices and bridging that gap between home and school. So typically that we're seeing that schools are penalizing our students for displaying behaviors um, that is okay within their culture and with their home environment. So we don't wanna be into forcing our students to mold into our systems. We want our systems to adapt to meet the needs of our students. So that's why I really get involved in the culture responsive PBIS research because that's changing how we are interpreting our behavior expectations, our policies. Are these punitive for our students? Or are these really helping our students to grow and be, um, flourish in this environment? Excellent. I know there's a couple other comments uh, here. Uh, we'll be running short on time as we just have a few minutes left. But another one just real quick was how do we move the assessment area of our field to include racial identity development as a social emotional development protective factor? Any comments on that from our panelists? I, it won't it won't be hard. Um, we just have to provide training to people at the EDS and the PhD level on understanding racial identity. Um, school psychologists is one of the, the only fields that you can't generally take as an elective, like a black psychology course. You know, um, majority institutions don't, don't offer those kind of courses in our, in our, in our college of education. Um, and so that hurts. That's where individuals kind of learn about racial identity, ethnic identity, and, and those type of things. Um, I was fortunate my mentor uh, was a counseling psychologist, uh, but she also had an EDS in school psychology. And so she really helped me, um, you know, to learn about those things, like who was who Bill Cross, um, who was Janet Helms. So, you know, first and foremost, I, I would take the time to do our own individual homework, search like Bill Cross, search Janet Helm, and then find out, you know, what's the difference between ethnic identity and racial identity. Um, search Robert Sellers and his measure um, the incoming president of APA, uh, Frank Worrell, he's part of that. Um, so we do have school psychologists who uh, talk about racial identity, ethnic identity. But unfortunately, if you talk to those individuals who want to publish in that area, until recently, you could not get that research published um, within the field of school psychology. So you've seen a big change over the last um, 
10 or 15 years, when I entered the field, it was really difficult to get anything that's centered on black individuals in the school psychology specific journal. So you saw those individuals published in counseling psych journals or you know other tiered you know types of journals. So homework first, and then you know we're diversifying our editorial boards, and and, and so that's a great thing that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. I'll also add briefly. I know we're at the uh, our time here, but um, I would uh, highlight the uh, awesome work of Dr. Heidelberg and the emer the emerging work that will be coming out pretty soon around embedding uh, racial ethnic identity into how we are already engaging with children in school. So thinking about embedding that within social emotional learning, within social skills instruction, and not just tacking it on to something else, but embedding it within our general curriculum and, and the structures that already exist within schools. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I know a lot of folks are out there doing the Zoom shuffle. Thank you for those on the East Coast who joined during your lunch hour and now need to get back to uh, go teach classes or be a, in class or helping children and families in our communities. A uh, big round of applause uh, to, to each of our presenters. It's such an honor, uh, such an incredible, esteemed group of panelists here with Dr. Heidelberg, Dr. Collins, Dr. Graves, and Dr. Woods. I know that there's been tremendous gratitude and appreciation expressed in the chat. And uh, if I had the option to do the little uh, emoji functions, I'd definitely be given big, uh, big shout out and uh, woot woot and uh, clap and gratitude for all of your ongoing efforts, as well as your presentation of information today that was so valuable for so many of us. And the forthcoming special topic section that you folks will be working on uh, reviewing those submissions. And as someone noted in the uh, question and answer that yes, the, co, uh, the guest editors will be also including an introductory piece where they're able to feature uh, very valuable information to help contextualize the series of papers that are included in the special topic section as well as uh, help to advance our thinking and our knowledge. And again, all are welcome to submit papers. It's not an exclusive situation where there's already a handful of papers and no one else has an opportunity to submit. It's an open call. All papers are given thorough consideration uh, through a triple blind peer review process that the School Psych Review uh, uses. And we welcome all of your submissions and ideas. If you have questions for them in advance, please reach out. Uh, they can, uh, you, their emails are widely available uh, online. And thank you for everyone, especially to our panelists for their presentations today. It's been so wonderful. So thank you, thank you. And I'll go ahead and pause this. <laughs>